Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this fourth um, Facebook Live brought to you by Vetorical Teleneurology. I hope you're all okay and managing during this fairly challenging time. Um, we um, are planning to run this Facebook Live session until the early June during the confinement period. And for us, the aim is not only to provide you with a little bit of free continuous education, um, on neurology, but if we can as well provide you a little bit of entertainment. Um, the format is very simple. Every week, Simon and I, we invite um, one of the key specialists in a subject. Um, we had last uh, week um, a radiologist, Ines Carrera, talking to us about MRI of FC and non-compressive disc. Before that, we have Mark Laurie on paroxysmal dyskinesia tonight. Um, I will introduce to you Chris Falzon. We will talk about management of disc associated wobbler. So we invite one of these key uh, people um, on, on the particular subject. Simon asked a number of questions uh, that we have selected um, for our guest speaker to answer. And then at the end of 20, 25 minutes, we open the floor to uh, all of you to ask direct questions to our guest speaker. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome a very close friend of mine, a very handsome Italian uh, boy as well, uh, Dr. Chris Falzon. Um, it's actually quite funny to have the picture of the two of you on the screen. Um, have you seen, guy? you know, this advert of before and after, you know, that you see sometime in, uh, in Health Magazine? It looked like, you know, during the confinement, you got the proof of the effect of, you know, malnutrition and overeating and over drinking. <laughs> I, knew, I knew there was going to be some comment about that, but I know our viewers can make sense of the fact that, um, okay, I can't compete for probably at this stage, the winner of the isolation or lockdown hairstyle that Chris has, um, yeah. nor can I compete for the four weeks of lockdown mustache that Laurent is actually showing there. <laughs> and that's what I achieved after four weeks. Four weeks. <laughs> I know. But as you can see, we've got uh, not only a, a fantastic you know, speaker. To me, um, he is probably one of the best you know, neurosurgeons in our European college, without a doubt. If I had a dog and okay. he had a neurological you know, problem that needed surgery, I know who I will call, and he will definitely be Chris, without a doubt. Um, Chris is Italian. Um, we had, uh, had the chance to work with Chris for three or four years when he moved to the UK. He's now uh, back in Italy. He's the president of SINVET, which is the Italian Association of Veterinary Neurology. He worked at the Diagnostica, I need to take a good breath because it's quite a long, Diagnostica Piccoli Animali in Vicenza. And if you don't know where Vicenza is in the Northeast Italy. And uh, Chris has a particular interest, which is neurosurgery but especially uh, disc-associated wobbler syndrome, which is going to share all his knowledge with us tonight. So um, without you know, more wait, I'm going to pass the mic to Simon to start this session by asking a number of questions um, to Chris. And I will um, uh, be back to take the question from the audience. Yeah. That's where we have to wake up, Simon. It, it, it looks frozen. I think the Simon is frozen. I'm afraid. Yeah. I think uh, we lost Chris, we want you know to put the the screen on. Um, I think the first question yeah. is: Could you tell us a little bit more what do you actually call um, disc associated wobbler syndrome and, and what kind of dog you put in that category? Yeah, sure. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for such a kind introduction, which is a a, a mixture of. Uh, a uh, nice friendship between the two of us and having worked together for quite a while. So thanks a lot and uh, hi to everyone. So I'm happy to try to give an answer to your question because uh, apparently... Oh, he's <laughs> well, did Laurent take, take my question? No, we thought uh, you were not. I did, I did. But we used to that. All right. Fair, fair enough, fair enough. Carry on. We are actually I, I, very worried about you, but let's try to move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll pay attention this time. Yeah, so basically, it's, uh, it seems to be an easy question, but it's not very easy because it's a disease that has been named with different terms. And um, uh, so disc-associated Wobber syndrome is one of them, of course. 
and probably not the one that I like the most. And the, the, probably the definition I like the most is the caudal cervical spondylomelopathy. For many reasons, this is because already orientate us where the problem is, which is in the most caudal part of the cervical spine. I don't know if you can see the slide, hope so. And um, with this disease, basically we refer to all the diseases that can potentially affect uh, the caudal part of the spine. Uh, it's a progressive disease and is caused by a, a, a mixture of degenerative disorders that can affect the invertebral disc, the ligament, and uh, sometimes even the uh, facets or other joint structures like the joint capsules. And all these things together tend to cause a stenosis of the vertebral canal, compression, and even more importantly, damage of the spinal cord. And uh, all the signs due to this compression and damage of the spinal cord can be grouped under this uh, caudal cervical spondylomelopathy or disc associated wobble syndrome, which is actually a real syndrome that tends to affect mostly Doberman, but we see this disease nowadays also in other breeds like Dalmatian, Weimar runner, or also Swiss mountain dogs, and uh, they are typically uh, middle-aged dogs. And uh, the most common clinical presentation is what we call two engines gate, where you can see that there is a very wobbly dog, and from there, the name of uh, Wobbler syndrome, so very wobbly and a steady gait, ataxia, to call it properly, on the back legs, and a short-strided gait on the front limbs. So this is a typical dobby with this uh, disc-associated wobbler syndrome or uh, cervical, cervical spondylomelopathy. Did I answer to your question? Well, I don't even know what Laurent asked, but I'm going to go with uh, that was it, because <laughs> I was absent, the internet, ow. Um, but I'm going to go. Oh, we lost him again. Yeah, I think uh, Simon has some issue with his uh, internet connection, I'm afraid. So the, I think the next question is, you know, what modality you use to diagnose this dog? Um, we understand, you know, that there is a lot of controversy with the name, you know, used for that mm -hmm. condition. Um, but from there, you know, what you're going to do next to investigate and to confirm that they, this is the disease that they are affected? Yeah. So basically, as I showed you already, um, the signalment and the history of those patients is uh, pretty uh, suggestive of those yeah, diseases. You, you so, accurately described what, what is meant by... Uh... Yeah, we keep losing him. I think, don't worry, don't worry. Sorry, guys. So, I don't want to ignore Simon, of course. I feel bad for him, but uh, I think I'm going on. This is uh, some All of right. the live problems, so we need to uh, get over them. So, uh, basically, uh, when we have the clinical suspicion in these guys, we need to confirm it. And the best way we have to confirm it, of course, is in imaging. And I remember the old days when we were taking x-rays, doing malography, and that was really entertaining, even a bit time consuming as well, but it was entertaining as well. So we did a lot of malography and dynamic malography as well. But nowadays, we definitely moved on to more advanced imaging modalities and, uh, of course, CT and MRI are the common imaging modalities we use in uh, uh, the uh, neuro field. Uh, for the diagnosis of um, uh, Wobber syndrome, uh, hopefully you can see the slide. There is still a bit of place for the CT scan. Definitely the CT is very useful to show us all the changes that may affect the bone, collapse of the intervertebral disc space, in case you have this mineralized disc, as you can see on your right, you can see also the stenotic canal with compression of the cord. Uh, in this particular case, it looks like there is intradural contrast medium, sorry, intrathecal contrast medium, but there is not actually. That was a seven-year-old dog, roughly Doberman, with the ossification of the dura, and you can see this nice contrast on the dura on this uh, sagittal reconstruction image that allows you to define even better the compression on the spinal cord. But nowadays, to be honest with you, I prefer most of the CT scan to evaluate any um, implant positioning, as you can see there, or new bone production, as you can see on the sagittal reconstruction underneath the 
plate. So this is to me the most probably uh, indicated use of the CT in the um, uh, disc associated wobbler patients. I definitely prefer more, much more the MRI and by combining the two, for example, very simply, T2 weighted and T1 weighted images, you still can appreciate some of the bony changes as well. You definitely see very well also the collapse of the intervertebral disc space, the spondylosis, the sclerosis, everything that is there. But on the top of that, you can see the very clearly the disc protrusion, the compression on the spinal cord, the stenosis of the vertebral canal, the damage, very important, the damage inside the spinal cord and tend to affect mostly the gray matter. And this is another example of another damage on C6, C7 with another protruded disc. And you can see that there is a chronicity, so very bad damage of the spinal cord, which is hyper intense on T2, that means bright, and hypo on T1. And if you uh, look at those associations, so hyper intensities on T2 and hypo on T1, you can definitely say that these are very bad damage, it's a chronic damage, it's a necrosis inside the spinal cord. On the top of that, if you move on a little bit, cranial, and you look at C5, C6 as well, you can see that there is another hourglass cord compression caused by both milder disc protrusion, but also dorsal compression caused by an hypertrophied interacquate ligament, which it could be another uh, part of the Wobble syndrome. Another thing that I like to do and I tend to do it 99.9 on my patient unless there is some anesthetic issues uh, or a very chronic and seems to look like a very static disease. If it's not the case, I always do traction and I want to see if there is response or the cut compression at least pre and post traction as you can see that and uh, that gives me a lot of information about the disease about a bit of the heteropathogenesis of the disease as well and also uh, about the treatment that uh, i may select on these guys nice i'm back can you hear me yeah i can yeah. laurent said he's paying me by the minute so um i've lost I've lost quite a lot of money right now because internet <laughs> anyway the, the next question um it is do you can do you consider that this is a surgical disease or is there a place for medical management yeah that's a very nice question i like to give you a, a straight answer and telling you this is a surgical disease because this is what i believe and this is actually what most of the human neurosurgeons believe when we have to deal with the, uh, their counterpart and uh, i'll try to answer to your question giving you a more scientific uh, demonstration that this is a surgical disease uh, of course when we look at the literature there is uh, uh, there are a couple of big names that made a, a sort of a history of this disease in uh, our field and uh, Instead of saying that there are similar results between uh, medical management and surgical management, I would say that there are some controversial results. So the name is controversial. Uh, the clinical signs are not. The diagnosis is not. And the, the name and the treatment is pretty controversial as well. When we look at one of the big papers published out on the literature, we can read that uh, when we consider medical treatment and surgical treatment in dogs, suffering from uh, disc-associated Wobble syndrome or called cervical spondylomyelopathy, whatever you like to call it, we have, we don't have a significantly different between groups in terms of outcome, and even, this, and even the survival time between the two groups, the medical and the surgical ones, it, it's pretty much the same. But if you look a bit more carefully, we can see that the owners reported that about 81% of dogs treated surgically were improved against 54%. So this is definitely open the discussion and may suggest that there is uh, more need to treat this dog surgically. And uh, even if you look more carefully on the results section, as the owner themselves said that the power of this analysis was very low. So from the statistic point of view, the power was about 27%, which is almost nothing when we have to say something and we have to prove something and uh, the authors themselves continue saying that they believe that there should have been a significant difference if they have considered a, a bigger number of cases probably suggesting that the surgical treatment would have been better 
And uh, definitely my answer is that there is, uh, uh, this disease is a surgical disease and um, we definitely need to have bigger numbers where we compare medical treatment to surgical treatment, we need to specify which kind of surgical treatment because not all the surgical therapies are the same, um, are the same I'm afraid. And uh, probably the aim would be like it happened already in the human field where for the same disease, which is called cervical spondylotic myelopathy, which is a very well-known disease and is considered 100% a surgical disease, what they're doing nowadays, and actually this is a, a paper from this month, so there are about, I mean, I would say numerous paper coming out every month only regarding the surgery of this disease. What they're doing nowadays is looking at what kind of factors can potentially predict the outcome after surgery. For example, they have noticed that the length of the symptoms before the surgery doesn't make any difference. They have noticed that the age, the older the patient is, the worse the outcome is going to be. And surprisingly, based on this paper here, also, for example, the milder the symptoms are, the uh, not satisfactory the improvement is. So basically, even uh, leaving that worse patient response less than minor affected patient probably is not that right. So probably what we have to uh, aim is looking at what kind of uh, clinical signs and MRI findings may uh, suggest us to pursue surgery more than medical treatment. Of course, if there is a very old patient and uh, probably taking some uh, other hint from the human field, if it's a very old patient, yeah, probably we definitely have to try at least the medical treatment. And also looking at any um, response to the treatment, we can say, okay, this is a dog that can potentially get better because he did get better on medical treatment. So, but if medical treatment, the improvement doesn't last long, we may suggest to pursue some other treatment option like the surgical option, of course. But that always in association with uh, how the neck of this dog looks like on an MRI and the chronicity, the damage and all these things. Right, well, the, I guess the follow-on question now is what type of, of surgical technique do you use if you have uh, disease at just one site? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, so as I told you, I'm pretty convinced that this is a surgical disease and I'm also pretty convinced that most of the techniques uh, we used in an old days, let's say up to 20 years ago, some 10 years ago, probably some of us uh, are not effective anymore. Like for example, the ventral slot, I quit doing ventral slot more than 15 years ago. And uh, I moved in, uh, uh, what I'm doing now is basically decompressing the spinal cord with the ventral slot. But on the top of that, I try to stabilize uh, the spine in a um, distract position, especially any time I've got the traction responsive uh, disease. So hopefully you can see the slide I put on for you. So this is a typical uh, Doberman neck with a problem between C6, C7, and this is what I'm doing nowadays. So what I'm actually doing is decompressing first the spinal cord by doing what we may call a full or a partial ventral slot in case there is a, a non um, traction responsive disease, I do a full ventral slot. I want to take as much as possible of the disc out in terms of uh, uh, to, in, for, the, for removing completely the spinal cord compression. Otherwise, I limit myself in doing what we may call a partial ventral slot just to allow the spacer that you can see there to put the spaces in between the two vertebrae and then we can put uh, two parallel plates below the vertebra and they definitely help in keeping the space up there and then we put the screws on the top and to do that it took me uh, at least the last eight nine years of my life i started doing ventral slot and then as loran remembers me probably doing uh taking the helium putting the helium between the vertebra screws and polymethyl metacrylate then we wanted for something that was quicker and we started to put only the intervertebral spacer and there are many spacers out on the market and this is one I like for example because you can put the two um, 
side of the spacer apart and you can keep the two vertebrae slightly bit more apart but unfortunately all of these techniques failed and actually we are achieving a bit of good results i believe so far at least some preliminary results telling me that this is what we uh, have to look for and this is the reason why let me show you this one here on the left you've got the pre-traction mri on the middle you've got the post-traction mri where you can see that there is a partially improvement of the compression and on the uh, far right you have a post-operative mri so this is the mri we took straight after the surgery in the same patient and you can see that there is no compression left and this is because we associated both the full ventral slot and this traction and stabilization with the method that I showed you. And this is what I want for my patient suffering from color cervix and spondylomalopathy. And even more, what I want as a surgeon, as a surgeon putting implants on my spine, I want the implant to stay as long as possible, hopefully for the entire life in the same position. And this is the same patient, three months, MRI recheck and as you can see uh, when you look again there yeah probably there is a mild progression of the intermedullary damage which is another thing we may face but there is no compression there is no collapse there is nothing deteriorated again on C67 which is the space of the treaty so this is definitely what I would recommend at uh, the dog of mine suffering from uh, this disease. And, and what are you doing if there's more than one site? So if uh, you've got two sites or more, you're doing the same surgery or another technique? Yeah. Uh, so far, I've done uh, a few patients with uh, two sites as well. So I think it's a surgical technique that can be done up to two sites, but I never done more than two sites. And I may be scary to do more than two sites. So... Uh, I still do the same technique if I've got two sites. If I have more than two sites, first of all, I still ask to myself if there is a space to do the surgery. And if I have to do some surgery, I don't know, it may go beyond your question, but if I have to do the surgery because the dog, let's say I've tried the medical treatment, the dog is not getting better, and the owner wants to do something for their dog, and definitely doing, uh, I may do, for example, uh, dorsal multiple laminectomy. So instead of doing a continuing one, I do a selective dorsal laminectomy placed over the affected space, let's say C4, C5, 5, 6, and C6, C7. That's it. And yeah, they get a bit, they get a bit better. Definitely you remove a little bit of the compression. And the dorsal laminectomy is, is, is still reported as a surgical technique amongst all the surgical techniques that have been published to treat these guys. And this is true also in the human counterpart as well. So I don't know if I answer you, Simon. Uh, the, I, I would say I will use it for one side for a maximum of two sides, but not more audio than that. Then. Um, you can hear you. Fine. Then I can't hear. Yeah, we can um, if you, you can if you can hear me um i've got my next question is you, you mentioned that you had uh done ventral slots in the plast uh, polymethyl yeah. methacrylate plugs prosthetic discs uh, why have you moved on from that to to this type of surgery yeah uh the reason why is uh, mostly because uh, so with ventral slot i was having a very big percentage unfortunately of uh uh, worsening after surgery. In some guys, at least, uh, uh, the, the worsening was even straight after the surgery. The dog was down on the floor for weeks and was used to send those patients, you know, I would say uh, out of sight, out of mind. So we were used to sending these patients to the physiotherapy, doing a lot of physiotherapy, and it took probably a month to get up again and walk a little bit. So I definitely abandoned the ventral slot probably even before starting in, uh, let's say, 15 years ago or 16 years ago, even with my tutor at that time, uh, with Massimo. And then uh, we started to um, fix it, so to distract and fuse it. But unfortunately, most of the of these patients tend to have what we call subsidence, which is this uh, collapse of um, the two vertebrae that you, two or three vertebrae that you put apart, they tended to collapse. I would say I had almost 90% of subsidence in all my previous, with all my previous uh, surgical techniques. Lucky enough, 
most of the guys from the clinical point of view still went pretty well so they most of those most of them sorry improved somehow uh, some of them were static they didn't get better but they didn't get worse as well which was already um listed amongst a success but to me it's not a big success so as a neurosurgeon as, as again as a surgeon putting implants uh, i'd like that my implants stay as long as possible in the way i put the implants there and this is why i moved i mean step by step i uh, hopefully in the next few months or hopefully in the next year there is a paper coming out where i compared a couple of different surgical techniques and one of the issue we also uh, measure was the degree of subsidence and with uh, this technique we definitely managed to decrease at least the subsidence and uh, by doing that i managed to have a bit of both good clinical improvement and uh, also a bit of uh, uh, less subsidence so clinical improvement a very graphic good pattern and and i think important for everyone out there um to be talking to their owners about is the success rate and what sort of success rate are you are you having with this technique and what challenges yeah. have you had to face yeah so definitely it's a technique like every to me every uh fixation technique that we may use in the spine is a very uh tricky surgery and it definitely requires a long learning curve for sure and even myself, I can tell you that the first cases I was doing with this approach, both ventral and dorsal approach, it actually took me about four, some of those guys, even four and a half hours to do the surgery. And nowadays I managed to, de um, uh, to decrease the uh, length of the surgery, the duration of the surgery to two and a half hours in case of one single space, uh, three hours, three hours and a few minutes if you have to do two sides. So definitely the duration of the surgery is uh, one of the, uh, let's say, um, downside of this technique. Uh, beside that, of course, you need to pay attention to where you put the screws. So definitely the surgical planning is very important and this is why you need to spend quite a while and you, be, you need to be very familiar with the MRI and CT. As I told you before, CT image uh, could be helpful for assessing the implant positioning, but could be also helpful pre-putting the implant. So in the planning phase, uh, to realize where your screws should go, the length of your screws, I tend to enter into the theater with all the measurements of the screws and the placing of the plates uh, very clear in my mind. So once you do that, and with a bit of practicing, I think you manage to decrease also some of the a major complication you may have and to be honest with you so far we didn't uh, we didn't experience a major complication a bit of bleeding of course when you do the full ventral slot like in every full ventral slot and prognosis wise i think i'm pretty much in line with what have been published and i like to share with you some preliminary results so i don't know how many people are watching us hopefully you manage to keep them for you because they're going to be published soon hope so so from the clinical point of view, at 30 days, we have 84% of patients that improved, 8% that are stable and 80 deteriorated. And unfortunately, we have to take these numbers as well. And let me disclose that with a lot of attention because it's a, a small uh, bunch of patients. So, but this is what we have at, 80 day, at 30 days. We managed to follow up these guys at least for 12 months, so one year, and we still have a good results because we have 61% that improved, 31% that were stable. So if we put those two numbers together, we have almost 90% of patients that are going well, which means almost 90% of owners that are pretty happy with what we did. And when we look at subsidence, which is, as I told you, uh, if you speak to an orthopedic guy, the, to them it's impossible that you put a plate in a long bone to a fixed fracture and a month later the plate is no longer as they put it so and this is why i'm pretty obsessed about subsidence so we look at subsidence from three months to three years after a minimum of three months in all these patients and in 54 we had non-subsidence in 15 mild and in 31 which is not 
very, I wasn't very happy and I'm not very happy with this number, moderate. But one of the most important things is that we didn't have any severe subsidence and most of the worst duration of the clinical signs fall in the severe group of subsidence. And this is uh, the numbers, uh, some preliminary numbers again, I'd like to share with you about uh, that we are achieving with this technique. Great. Well, thank you very much for sharing those with us and for, and for your answers. Yeah, I can hand you back now to, to Laurent, um, who's got some questions from the live audience. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, You're very welcome. You can see Chris is extremely enthusiastic and, you know, that's what makes him a really good surgeon. Is he special? As you can see, you can speak, you know, probably all night about this, this concept. Um, I had the chance to yeah, see right. Chris King as well. And I can tell you he has the same passion and also, you know, expertise in making a good Italian meal that he's got in making a good surgery. Um, we got quite a lot of questions from the audience. We're going to spend the next yeah. 10 minutes. The first one is, um, what type of spacer uh, do you use and where do you get this spacer? Yeah, the spacer is uh, created by a French company. It's called Portavet. And I like the spacer as this type of spacer, as I told you before, because you can adjust it to the uh, vertebral end plates a little bit. It's not, of course, contoured to the vertebral end plates, but you can open it a little bit to keep them apart. And on the top of that, the spacer is um, empty inside, and that gives you the chance to put uh, cancellous bone. What we put there is lyophilized bone, and we recreate this bone with um, uh, homologous blood, and that should help the fusion of the two vertebra. But I know uh, other surgeons using different types of spacer, and they are pretty happy with that. And uh, uh, let me tell you that I've done some patients as well, which are not in the paper, but I've done also some other patients. For example, uh, I remember some greyhounds. I've done some greyhounds where the space is uh, too small to allocate a spacer and I put different types. For example, I put sternebrae or even plaques, uh, cement plaque. It doesn't make a big different, a difference, to be honest with you, this, what kind of space that you use as long as you are happy with it, of course. Definitely, if you can prefer one of the spaces that allows these bone breeds between the vertebrae, it's much better instead of putting some it's cement plant. It's a veterinary company. It's a veterinary company, yeah. It's called uh, Portavet. It's a French company. Good. Um, question about the concept of traction. I think what um, this yeah. person is asking is how do you, what kind of weight do you put, you know, when you do the traction, if there's a, a percentage of the body weight? Do you put the animal yeah. lateral dorsal recubancy when you do that? Yeah. I can't see all these uh, things in the question. L you are making uh, more wider, Laurent. <laughs> anyway, no worries. He's been, he's been drinking, so um, it could oh, okay, that's it, right. it could go on. I can't see only please explain the concept of attraction, but it's fine. You know, I like to talk about this disease. So, no worries. <laughs> So I can see the question, no worries. I can tell you why we do traction and we can see. So of course, of course we put the, um, you should put the patient uh, depending on uh, what your MRI machine allows you to do. Most of the MRI machine has got pretty big gantry, which means you can put the patient, which is what I like in dorsal recumbency. And then you apply a weight on his jaw and there are a couple of papers out telling you how much weight, which is really subjective, to be honest. There is nothing that has been proven to be effective or, and nothing that has not been proven to be effective. We tend to use the rule of about 20, 25% of the body weight of the dog. And uh, we use the traction just to see if uh, putting, if during the surgery, we have to limit ourselves in this tract in the vertebra or if not, which means if that after the traction, we have what we call a purely dynamic compression or a purely traction responsive compression, we may probably doing only traction during the surgery and put the screws, spacer, plates, both below and above the spine and that's it. But if after traction there is still, still sorry, some residual cord compression, definitely we have to take that off before putting any implants, okay? 
but don't limit yourself in doing a ventral slot, even if you think you remove the entire compression, because you made these guys even worse, because the intervertebral displace will, will collapse more, you will have some friction, and most of these guys, unfortunately, will get worse. And the other thing I can tell you, when you do the traction, please, if you don't have a traction responsive form, you can stop with one single plane, which is the sagittal plane, pre and post traction. But if you have the impression that you have a resolution, full resolution of the cord compression after traction, looking at the sagittal, run also the transverse view, because sometimes you have some surprises because you may have lateralized compression that you may underestimate if you look only at the sagittal. So anytime you think that your patient suffers from a traction responsive form based on this pre and post sagittal, run also the transverse just to make sure that there is no residual compression on the lateral aspect of the vertebral canal. And on the same topic of traction, I mean, do you do traction on every patient? I mean, when do you do that? Do you go with breed, as this person is asking? Do you go with breed, or what no. makes you say that on the Labrador with a disc herniation, are you going to do traction? Yeah, that's a very good point. To be honest with you, I've, uh, I love surgery, but I also love MRI. Probably my first love uh, from the scientific point of view after neurology was MRI and then was neurosurgery. So I played a lot with MRI as well, and I spent a lot of time, uh, I don't know if I have to say that, but I spent a bit of time also to do traction in normal disc extrusion or in what we may call normal disc protrusion in a Labrador in, with a C3-C4 disc protrusion to see if they make any difference. First of all, if there is a disc extrusion, there is no need to do traction. If there is extruded material spread out in the vertebral canal, we need to do a full ventral slot. So most of these guys we are talking about suffers from a disc protrusion and not a disc extrusion. So if you have a disc protrusion, you may wonder why or why not should I do traction? So if you have a disc protrusion and the disc protrusion is affecting the most caudal part, which is the more mobile area, the most mobile area of the neck, there is always the bit of space to do the traction to see if there is a traction responsive or not, even if it's another Doberman and it's a Labrador. So if it's something in between like C3, C4, probably there is no much point to do that because it's definitely more stable than the most caudal part of the neck. So I would recommend to do traction Anytime you have to deal with the caudal aspect of the cervical spine, with the disc protrusion and not an extrusion, and especially, of course, if it's one of the breed we tend to see more often, which are, again, Doberman, Bamarana, Dalmatian, uh, Bernice Mountain dogs, have done some uh, German Shepherd dogs, uh, Greyhounds as well. So in those guys, I would definitely recommend to do traction as well. I'm going to take a couple more questions for you, Chris. Um, yeah, sure. quite a few about um, domino effects. So I'll choose one. Um, yeah. After distraction fusion, do you see some patients suffering so-called domino effect? And yeah. how do you face? Yeah, this is a very good question. To be honest uh, with, um, uh, with all of you, um, we still are questioning a little bit about what domino effect uh, really means. So... Before, we believed definitely that after the surgery, we predispose the more anterior spaces to develop the disease. But since we tend to see the same development of the uh, deterioration of the diseases in the most cranial spaces, even in the patient that have not been treated, we wonder if this is a more natural progression of the disease, is more natural cause of the disease rather than representing a real consequence of the surgery that we did. Yeah, I do see some patients, of course, that tend to develop later on the disease. For example, last week I re-scanned a dog that two years and um, deteriorated uh, after the C67 fixation with the technique that I showed you before, and this dog had C5, C6 disease. So it's wonderfully nicely be between C67, but developed C5, C6, this protrusion, and I'm, I'm actually planning to do the surgery at C5, C6 in the next uh, uh, week at C5, C6, and we don't tend to see the progression of this disease moving on to C4, C5, and then C3, C4. So uh, I would say that 90% of the patients suffer from C5, C6, and C6, C7, and some of them we tend to see 
the disease located there already from the beginning. And in some others, we, yeah, we see C67 and progression to C5, C6 in a matter of years most of the time, not in a matter of months. But in some others, uh, we tend to see the disease in C67 and that's it, not any kind, not any sign of domino effect, if it really exists the domino effect and is not the natural cause of the disease. Did that make it clear? Definitely. Thank you. Let, uh, I'm going to put the last question. Um, yeah. actually, I apologize, it was not this one. Um, there was a question about the dorsal screw. There was a few questions about that. Yeah. Um, how do you position the screw and you use fluoroscopy? Yeah. For that, for this dorsal yeah, screw, the concept of dorsal screw, uh, probably not yeah. many people are using it, so it's probably interesting to hear your view on that. Sure, uh, I definitely do. I mean, dorsal screws wasn't my idea; it was the idea of uh, Daniele Scorlazzoli, which is another, uh, was another very good neurosurgeon we have in Italy, uh, who lost playing as well with the spinal fixation. I uh, took the idea from him, and I definitely think that they made the differences because. Uh, when we think of the spine, well, I mean, every surgical technique so far in the vet field uh, focused only on the ventral aspect for the neck. It didn't consider at all the dorsal aspect. But the point of motion in the spine is not the body. It's probably something in somewhere in between the body and the articular facets. And this is why to prevent collapse and subsidence, we need to stabilize both. If you want that the implants you put there stay as long as possible. So I would definitely recommend if you want to achieve the best, both from the clinical and the radiographic point of view from your technique to pull the dorsal screws. The dorsal screws, Daniele, for example, use fluoroscopy. I prefer uh, to do an open access. I prefer to visualize the articular facets and that gives me more confidence not to be wrong. Even because when you pull the two vertebral body apart, even the articular facets are doing that they have this kind of telescopic motion and you may have just a little bit of uh, facets facing each other and you have to make sure that you keep that area for the screw to be stable. And this is why I prefer to do a proper dorsal approach, not, pro not definitely big approach. I point my index finger on the spinous process of T1, move, sliding a little bit more cranial, cut it, visualizing the articular facets of C67 and C5, C6 as well, if you have to do both sides on both sides, and then putting the screws from medial to lateral and cranial to caudal. This is what we do. And, and you don't when use, you start to do that... You don't use you, fluoroscopy for the positioning? No, because, uh, I, again, we te we, I do see the articular facets. So I skeletalize, I remove all the muscles there, and I can see pretty clearly the articular facet. So that I do point the screws away from the midline, so no risk at all. I measure the length of the screws, not to pinch any nerve root, so there is no risk for doing that without fluoroscopy, as long as you see what you are doing. Thank you very much, Chris, for taking the time to answer all very these questions. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, yep, thanks, Chris. Excellent. I think we probably will have to close. Simon needs to have his nap. Um, so. Just to announce what we've got in line for the next few first days, as I say, we're going to run this event uh, during the wool lockdown, probably until early June. Um, next week, we've got another fantastic speaker. We've got Professor Claire Wisbridge, who will talk about how do I manage Chiari Siringomalia. Uh, Claire has, um, again, a lot of experience on this subject, and she has kindly accepted to share this with you. Um, another very interesting topic um, that will be on the 14th of May. Uh, Dr. Lisa Bartner from Colorado State University talking about the use of cannabidiol in epilepsy. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you had the question from Pet Owner, you know, about shall I use this type of uh, cannabidiol um, in my dog? And uh, in uh, three weeks' time, that will bring us to the 21st, we've got Dr. Colin Driver, who will talk about how do I manage thoracolumbar myelopathies in pug dogs. So again, um, another neurosurgical topic. Um, please join me all to give a virtual uh, thank you and applaud to our guest speaker, uh, Chris Fazone. Uh, Chris, carry on. Well. I miss you a lot. I miss your food especially. And uh, thank you very much again for your time. Have a good day, everyone. You're very welcome, guys. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye. You're welcome, Simon. Bye-bye.